Hello everybody, Tactic Zombies here. Welcome to the last video of the World at War Zombies retrospective series. In today's episode we will be talking about Darius, also known as The Giant. So now these maps are going to start getting a bit more complex with story and easter eggs and whatnot, I'm going to start splitting up these videos into three parts. The first part will be dedicated to the gameplay and the differences between remasters if it's applicable, because not every map has a remaster. Part two will be all about the story of the map. And part three will be all about the easter eggs and secrets that are on the map. Without any further ado, let's get right into the retrospective. So we're going to be starting as we always do with the loading screen. This is definitely the most uh, gruesome of the World at War loading screens, at least in my opinion, because it's a bloody map of the Darius facility with, you know, like a finger, vacuum tube, eyeball, just like sciencey things, you know. As for the actual layout of the map, much like Nocturne Toten and Verruckt, it is heavily based off of a multiplayer map. In this case, it is Nightfire from DLC 1. Unlike Noct and Verruckt, where their maps were only sections of the multiplayer maps, albeit very big sections, they were pretty big buildings, Darius uses much more of Nightfire space comparatively. I think having all this extra space at his disposal does just great things in making Darius have the most interesting layout of a map in World at War, it's definitely the most complex. I don't know if it's the biggest, Shino Numa might have more square footage, but it's definitely just the, again, it's the most complex, most interesting layout. Overall, just a big step up from the previous maps up to this point. The loading screen also tells players their objective on the map, to link each of the teleporters to the mainframe, as well as giving them their location on the map. As you spawn in, you're spawn facing a chamber of sorts with the closing door, as the loudspeaker makes the announcement that... Why don't someone go turn the power on? Because of how the players spawn facing the machine, it immediately gets them to go over and investigate what's actually inside the closed off area. A new player will likely see that it's called the Pack-a-Punch, but they probably won't know what it does yet. If you go up to investigate the Pack-a-Punch machine, you're also very likely to pass over the pad in front of the machine that'll say the power must be turned on. So, even if it's subconsciously the player already knows the power's off, there's this new mysterious Pack-a-Punch machine, and that it needs power to be accessed. You may also notice three big wires leading out from the top of the machine, and then going all throughout the rest of the map. This is just some really good game design on Treyarch's part, because it doesn't outright tell you how to open a Pack-a-Punch, or what it is, what you need to do, but it gives you enough clues that if you're perceptive and you investigate a little bit, you're probably going to put the pieces together yourself without needing to look up anything online. The player can also see if the map is set in your Breslau, which this just helps with the world building a little bit, nothing too crazy. And since Darius is the first map with a real objective to it, and is also just the most complex map up to this point, you can pause the game to see a simplified version of the map from the loading screen, which will remind the player where the teleporters they need to link to the mainframe are, if you ever lose track of your goal. So on Darius, the player has two routes to the power room, which this is the formula basically every single map is going to follow from here on out. Unlike Verruckt, which also had two routes to power, both sides are of equal length, because on Verruckt, one side had three doors, the other had five. Here, both sides have three doors to get the power, so you're not at a disadvantage for picking one side over the other. Both sides also have a door that is power locked, meaning you have to take the long way around to power. You can't just cut through the like walkway that's open, that will open once you turn power on. When you finally do get power on, the map becomes much, much more easy to navigate. Firstly, a bridge will lower and that'll connect the two halves of the map, which were previously up to this point separated, so now you can run circles basically around the whole front part of the map. And then the two blockades, one on either side of the spawn room, will lower for the player, allowing you to return to spawn, because you actually had to drop down from the second story to get to power, and you couldn't get back up. This allows you to return back to spawn and make your way back the way you came. Now that the player has turned the power on, they can start looking into unlocking the Pack-a-Punch back at spawn. Whether you use one of the maps, or just explore long enough, or follow the wires from the machine, you're eventually going to stumble across one of the three teleporters. If you're still unsure as what to do, the characters will even give you a quote just to make sure you know this is what you have to link. I think we gotta link these somehow. If you stand inside one of these teleporters and hold the interact button, a 30 second countdown will begin. And you can see a little pocket watch will pop up in your corner, letting you know how much longer you have. And you have to run back to the pad in front of the Pack-a-Punch machine and interact with that to link the teleporter back to the spawn room. The door to the Pack-a-Punch will lower slightly, and then as a reward for your efforts, you'll also be granted a random drop, which in this case, it was a max ammo, which is pretty nice. 
there are three teleporters on the map that must be linked to open up the pack punch machine. Teleporter A is located in the animal testing area of the map. Teleporter B is located next to the garage slash hangar area of the map. And finally is Teleporter C. It is behind the power room and it is the furthest thing on the map from the spawn area. Once a teleporter has been linked, it also becomes available as a transportation method. Much like the Shinonuma zipline, this costs 1500 points and it will return you to the spawn room and it does send you to the same place no matter which of the three teleporters you use. And then much like when you link the teleporters, you will also receive a bonus drop, just as a little extra treat. These aren't very viable as a straight-up transportation method because Darius is a small enough map as is. I mean, you literally have to run across the map in less than 30 seconds to even get the teleporters to work in the first place. But these are a really good save me option if you're backed in a corner or if you need to have a breather. Just like, they're a better save me tool than they are a transportation method. The teleporters are still cool nonetheless, and we're going to see them a ton throughout the rest of Zombies from here on out. These are here to stay. When the player finally links all three of the teleporters, A, B, and C, the Pack-A-Punch machine will be fully open for them to use, and oh my goodness, it's awesome. Pack-A-Punch is arguably Darius's greatest and longest lasting innovation to the Zombies mode, as Pack-A-Punch has become just as integral to the Zombies experience as things like perks have. As for what the Pack-A-Punch actually does, for the price of 5,000 points, it'll change your gun's name, give it a new camo, upgrade its stats, overall just turns your guns better. You could say it helps them pack a punch. Ha 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 ha. Most weapons get pretty standard upgrades, all things considered, but there are of course some exceptions. Arguably the most notable of these is the Colt 1911, the starting pistol. If you hold on to it long enough to get Pack-A-Punch open and then Pack-A-Punch it, you'll be rewarded with the C-3000 Biatches. It's an explosive pistol, does as much damage as the ray gun. Stuff like this is a great way to get players to think outside the box and try Pack-A-Punching everything because you don't know what might have some crazy upgrade that you wouldn't expect. I feel this helps make the map a bit more replayable. The Hellhounds from Shinonuma also make their return here. They function almost identically to how they did on Chino Numa, just with a lot of the glitches patched out. For instance, I never had a dog not drop the max ammo on Doris when that happened pretty frequently on Chino Numa. The biggest change though, starting on round 17 up, the dogs will start to spawn in with zombies during normal rounds instead of just being kept to their own separate rounds. They do still have their own dedicated rounds past this point, but they'll spawn in with zombies as well on normal rounds. As for new weapons, there are two. First is the Bowie Knife, it is a melee upgrade that costs 3,000 points, and it makes your knife a one-hit kill until round 9. This is really good for getting points early game, as if you can save up and get the Bowie Knife at like round 6 or 5 or so, you can just use that until round 10, and then you'll have a ton of points saved up and you'll just be loaded for the early game. The other new weapon is the now super iconic Monkey Bombs. These take the player's tactical grenade slot, and they are a toy symbol monkey with a big bundle of dynamite strapped to its back. The player can throw the monkey bomb, and then it'll start playing a song, and it'll attract all the zombies to it, and then after a couple seconds, it'll explode. As an actual weapon, these things kind of suck. Like, they stop killing zombies at a super low round, especially compared to some tactical grenades that would appear in later zombies games. The monkeys really shine as a utility tool. Like, the distraction effect will help you buy a couple of pressure seconds if someone goes down and you need to revive them, or if you need to pack a punch, especially on this map where pack a punch is way up in the middle and you're on a little platform, it's easy to get swarmed. Overall, the monkeys are a very welcome addition, and I'm really happy that some rendition of them has popped up in basically every single Zombies game since. The Wonder Wolf also makes its return on Darius, but it is severely neutered due to a glitch that basically makes it useless on this map. Basically, if you zap yourself with the Wonder Wolf, it'll nullify your Juggernog, and this is permanent, and it's just it's awful, especially on Solo, where you can't just go down and rebuy Juggernog. It completely ruins the effectiveness of the weapon. The weapon can be Pack-A-Punched into the Wonder Wolf DG3JZ, which it gets a really cool Pack-A-Punch reskin, it looks kinda like a bluish chrome. The lightning it shoots now is red instead of blue. Overall, I think it's a really awesome looking weapon, but it just sucks because, again, if you shoot yourself with it, you'll lose Juggernog and you'll basically ruin your game. So, as unfortunate as it is to say, just stay away from the Wonder Wolf when you're playing, at least World at War Darius. This is a real tragedy of a weapon right here. The Electric Traps also make their return on Darius, and there are three of them this time, which is less than Shino Numa, but more than Barak. There is one in the doorway into the garage slash hangar area of the map. 
There's another one in the doorway into the animal testing part of the map. And the last one is underneath the bridge that connects the two halves of the map, right in front of the power switch. The color of the glow around the mystery box, as well as the color of its beam that shoots up in the sky, is now blue, instead of like the yellowish green that it was on Shinonuma. This is how it's going to be on most of the maps going forward. Not all of them, but most of them. And then lastly is that the zombies are no longer capped at 24 per round when playing on solo, so even on solo, zombies will scale exponentially forever. This is how it's going to be in every single map going forward, so you better get used to it. The sad thing is that there's no more records that are like around 10,000 plus though. And that about does it for the original version of Doris. Let's get right into the Black Ops 1 version. So starting with the loading screen, it has a much more comic booky and cartoony look than the one in World at War had. This version is also a bit toned down compared to the original, like the finger is gone, the eyeballs are placed with a bolt. This one's just a bit more sanitized than the original one. The first big thing you're gonna notice is just how much brighter this version of the map is. Like this was true for the other World at War remasters on Black Ops 1. It's most obvious on Doris and Shinonuma. And like, you know, all the dark shadows are gone. Like this is just a much brighter, much less creepy version of the map. Mule Kick has been added to the map. It's in the hangar area of the map slash garage right in front of the mystery box spot. All of the weapons in the mystery box are now Black Ops 1 guns, but all the guns on the wall are still their World at War versions. Probably the biggest change on this version of the map is that the Wonder Waff is no longer glitched. You can hit yourself all you want with the Wonder Waff, you'll never lose your Juggernaut. This is just a great improvement, as that was the big thorn in original Doris' side, in my opinion. And lastly, the character you play as is now randomized, so you can be playing solo, and you can play as Takeo, for example, or Richtofen, or Nikolai. You can play as anyone when playing solo now. You know, there's not a whole lot of character quotes on the original Doris, and having to hear Dempsey's forever can get a little boring after a while, so this is a great change. And that about covers the gameplay. Note, I won't be covering the giant in this video, as I feel like it changes enough to warrant its own video, and I feel like it'd be a nice way to mix up the longer videos in Black Ops 3. Maybe I'll make it as like an addition to the Shadows of Evil video. I just feel like talking about the giant would fit more with Black Ops 3. I feel like it's got enough differences, like a different cast and different storyline stuff, so I'll save the giant for a later time, is what I'm saying. Overall, I feel like the Reese is almost perfect truly did revolutionize zombies as a whole, and so many maps beyond this point would try and recapture the magic that Doris has, successfully or unsuccessfully, get to it later, but I'm gonna keep it brief because I'm gonna have a more in-depth conclusion later. Doris is just awesome, it's the best map on World at War by far, in my opinion. It's got the most replayability, it's got the most interesting layout, just overall this is a top tier zombies map. So without any further ado, let's get right into the story segment of the video. Okay, so I'm going to be frank, this isn't going to be the most in-depth story analysis ever, because I'm not really the person for that. I know enough about the zombie story, but I don't know everything. So think of this more as a thorough summary than as a deep, in-depth analysis. I will be a bit more in-depth with Doris, just because there isn't as much to talk about, but like on future maps, especially like in the Black Ops 3, Black Ops 4, I'm just going to give a quicker rundown, because there's stuff about those games I still don't know, like even to this day. So Doris tells its story through seven radios hidden throughout the map, and this really was the beginning of the zombie's timeline as far as we knew for the longest time. So I'm going to give a rundown of the radios, I'm going to summarize each of them in the order that I think makes the most sense. I don't know if there's another, like, official chronological order for the radios, but this is the order that from listening to them and reading transcripts, they fit together most neatly, in my opinion, in this order. So, let's get right into it. So the first radio can be found on a shelf directly in front of Teleporter C. Dr. Maxis and Dr. Richtofen are running teleporter tests, and this is test number three. The test fails, and it even sounds like the test subject is liquefied since they need to clean up the teleporter afterwards, but they immediately get ready to run another test. The second radio is located in the tunnel that runs underneath Maxis' office, directly underneath the quick revive machine. It is hidden off behind these little wooden boards back here. It took me a little while to find. This radio is the wordiest out of all of them, so I'll try and be quick, but this is probably going to be the longest summary. The DG2 tests are far exceeding the expectations of Group 935, so Maxis wants additional funding so they can mass produce within a couple of years. Maxis also needs a more consistent source of Element 115, otherwise they won't be able to mass produce. The teleporters also aren't liquefying people anymore, but it sounds like they're leaving you in a vegetative state instead, where you're unresponsive. Maxis wants to increase the scope of experiments at Group 935, and to do so he needs a bigger source of 115, and also a larger energy conduit, is what he refers to it as. 
he also mentions that apparently Group 935 spies have found out that the Americans have a big source of 115 at the Nevada base, which I'm pretty sure is supposed to be Area 51. Like, I'm almost certain it's Area 51. Then he basically signs off the letter asking for money and says he's willing to discuss more with the actual High Command if they get back to him. Raider number 3 is located inside of the animal testing area of the map. It is in this radio that we are introduced to Max's daughter Samantha. She's going to be a very huge player in the zombie storyline. Maxus gives Samantha a pet dog named Fluffy and basically tells her how big of a responsibility this is, especially because Fluffy is pregnant and to be careful with her. Sam asks if they can keep the puppies, to which Maxus says they'll have to see. Radio 4 can be found in the spawn room in this little alcove next to this barrel. In the radio, you can hear Maxus ordering around a zombie, to which it complies at first. Eventually, the zombie attacks Maxus and it is shot. Maxus then immediately asks for another zombie to be brought into the testing area. Radio number 5 has Maxis and Richtoff is tying Fluffy down for teleporter test number 5. They power on the teleporter and Fluffy's gone, and Richtoff is just so excited over this, but Maxis is more worried because Fluffy hasn't reappeared anywhere, so they shut down the mainframe and get ready for test number 6. Test number 5 is declared a failure by Maxis. Radio number 6 we found directly under teleporter A in the animal testing area of the map. Richtoff and Maxis are preparing for teleporter test number 6. Maxis accuses Richtofen of having set up the teleporter incorrectly, but then you can hear a hellhound spawn in behind them. Fluffy has now reappeared, but she has become the first hellhound. Somehow Samantha has gotten into the test chamber, and she asks Maxis what happened to Fluffy. Maxis reassures his daughter that that isn't Fluffy anymore, and he tells her to stand by him for safety. All of a sudden, Richtofen seals Dr. Maxis and Samantha inside of the teleporter. Maxis pleads Richtofen to let them out of the teleporter, but... Richtofen does not. Instead, he activates the teleporter and sends the two Maxises to who knows where before laughing maniacally as the radio ends. The final radio can be found in the teleporter B room on this ladder connected to this tank. The radio is recorded by Dr. H. Porter at the fall of the Doris facility. You can hear an alarm, gunshots, zombies, just all hell is breaking loose. Porter prays that God will forgive them for what they've done before killing himself. And that's the Doris story. There's nothing too crazy, especially compared to some of the maps that we get later, especially in like Black Ops 3 and 4, but this is such a very well fleshed out story, it's very self-contained. Like, this not only works great as a jumping off point that a huge saga could be built off of, like, as we saw was what happened. I think it also could have worked well if Doris was the last Zombies map, because it was the last map in World at War, and if we would have never got Zombies in Black Ops, I think this still would have been a nice way to finish up the zombie story, you know, it gives you all the answers that you needed up to this point, live enough up to theorization. Overall, super solid, it sets a precedent for what all zombie stories will be from here on out. Overall, two thumbs up from me. Now let's get to the really fun part of the video, the Easter eggs and secrets. Let's get right into it. So let's knock out the big one first, the flytrap. This is the first real quest in Call of Duty Zombies, and even calling it a quest is pretty generous because there's only two steps, four if you really want to be generous and stretch it. First, you have to shoot this little panel that's on the structure that's like out past where the zombies spawn, just outside of the front door into the animal testing lab. But you have to shoot it with the pack-a-punch weapon though. But when you shoot it, all these green objects will float up into the air and you'll hear... So that's step one. Step two, you have to go play hide-and-seek with Samantha by finding and shooting three of her toys that are now hidden throughout the map. You can find the toys in any order, there's no set way you need to go about this step. One of these toys is in a cage in the animal testing area, it's a teddy bear with a juggernaut bottle and a Colt 1911. Another one is another teddy bear, this one has a bowie knife, and it is in a burning window overlooking the spawn room. Ow, you another one. The final toy is a monkey bomb located in a furnace in the garage area of the map, right next to Teleporter B. And that's the flytrap easter egg. There's no real reward or incentive to doing it other than an achievement that you get for actually shooting the panel and starting the easter egg. There's nothing you get for completing it though. 
I think this is more cool to look back and see just how far Zombies quests have come, because now the Easter egg quests are one of the big selling points of a new Zombies map, you know? So it's just cool seeing how humble of beginnings they had. And that's even if you consider this an Easter egg quest. I know some people don't. I do, personally. But, like, I know most people would say that the first Easter egg quest was on Ascension, but we'll get to that later. The Easter egg song in this map is Beauty of Annihilation by Alina Siegman and Kevin Sherwood, and it can be activated by interacting with three glowing jars of brains with spinal cords connected to them. There are two in the back of the animal testing area, and then there was the last one, which is in the lab overlooking the garage, right next to Teleporter B. If you throw a monkey bomb into the furnace, this will happen. There are maps at every single teleporter that show you how much progress you've made, anything in red has yet to be linked, and anything in green has been linked. This is just a cool in-game way of letting people know how much progress is left for getting Pack-a-Punch open. I can see this being good in a public game back in the day where, you know, not everyone's gonna have a mic, so, you know, the whole team's just gonna be super disorganized doing their own thing. You can see a bloody paw print behind these stairs in the tunnel next to Teleporter C. This is more than likely from Fluffy, the now zombie dog. If you go prone next to a perk machine, you'll actually find a quarter under it, and you'll see your points counter will go up by 25, or it'll say plus 25, but it'll actually give you 30. I think this is because World at War doesn't have, like, single-digit point values. In Black Ops 1, however, it'll actually give you exactly 25 points when you go prone next to a perk machine, as opposed to the 30 that it would give you in World at War. This works with every single perk machine on the map, except for Mule Kick in Black Ops 1, which does not have any money hidden underneath it, and I think this is because Mule Kick was added later down the line, they just forgot to put the little easter egg in there with it. The actual teleporters themselves are supposed to be Dyag Lock, the real-life supposed wonder weapon that the Germans were developing during the Second World War. As for what Dyag Lock was supposed to do, if it was even real in the first place, theories range from anti-gravity to teleportation and time travel, among other things. As a matter of fact, Doris as a whole was heavily inspired by Project Doris in Poland, which was an underground facility where the Germans were purported to have been working on many experimental weapons, such as the aforementioned Dyag Lock. An example of this inspiration is that the structure that you start the flytrap easter egg from is actually based off of a real concrete structure that was located at the real-life Project Reese facility. Each of the teleporters has a hidden piece of wood near it that shows what the teleporter's original destination was intended to be. We can see that teleporter A was meant to go to France, teleporter B was meant to go back to Germany, which doesn't really make sense seeing as the map's already set in Germany, or like it was Germany back in 1945, but whatever. And then Teleporter C was meant to go to England. In the tank on the left side of the Teleporter B room, you can see there's a pair of legs floating under the grate. Also from the Teleporter B room, on the balcony that has a mystery box spawn location on it, you can see a hanging man across the street in the building. I believe this is supposed to be Dr. Porter from earlier, and there's also a bunch of weird symbols written on the wall behind him in, like, chalk. And lastly, when you pack-a-punch with the Wonder Wop on the Black Ops version of the map, instead of having the chrome pack-a-punch camo, you get a cool, unique, golden pack-a-punch camo, which this is, this is just cool. I like this. And that wraps up Therese. As I already mentioned earlier, I plan on talking about the giant when I get to Black Ops 3, as I feel like that'd be just a good way. A good way to mix up the more longer, more complex maps that are at the tail end of Black Ops 2 and then Black Ops 3, so I'm gonna save it for then. Overall, I think Doris is hands down the best map on World at War. I think it has the best layout, it utilizes the space the best. It's also not overcomplicated like some zombies maps can be, which, I mean, it had, they very easily could have run the risk of being overcomplicated compared to what came before, but they handled the jump very well. I also feel that Doris is the most replayable map due to the pack-a-punch machine and it kind of incentivizing you to pack-a-punch everything to keep playing the map to kind of see what you like and, you know, to see what weapons get crazy upgrades when you pack-a-punch on, like, the Colt and, I know, like, the M1 carbine becomes fully automatic and stuff like that. It's real. adds a lot more replay value than the other maps add up to this point. I also feel that Doris is the most challenging World at War map, especially compared to its predecessors. And storing here is a great jumping off point for the rest of the zombie saga, as it's very tightly written, and the way it's told, you know, the manner in which it's told, like with being secret radios you have to go out of your way to find, really hooked people in back when World at War came out, and still, 
to this day, most of the zombie storyline is still told through secrets like this, so this really did set the precedent of what was to come. A map having a basically useless wonder weapon, especially on Solo, is just a... You can't not excuse that. That's just really bad game design, and it's bad that they never patched it out, so... That's the biggest fault to have against this map. The Wonder Off is fixed on the Black Ops version, although I think I still prefer the World at War version just due to its atmosphere being a bit darker, and I also just really like the World at War weapons like the Browning, MG42, just all the World War II guns I have a really soft spot in my heart for. The Black Ops 1 guns, you know, they're cool, but a lot of them don't really hold up very well when high rounding, and there's also just a bunch of duds in the Black Ops 1 mystery box. Overall, Darius was a huge step forward for zombies, I mean, you could even say it was a giant step forward. And I think it's very safe to say that Darius is Zombies' first, almost perfect map. And thus concludes the World at War Zombies retrospective. These videos were a blast to make, but I wanted to let you guys know I'm going to be taking a couple weeks off just to kind of recharge my batteries before moving to Black Ops 1, because I really don't want to burn myself out, I don't want these videos to turn into a chore for me. I absolutely plan on moving to Black Ops 1 soon, but again, I just need a couple weeks, maybe a month max, to just recharge my batteries and recoup. I will go back to posting normal videos until then, which are going to be more gameplay oriented instead of these retrospective long form videos. As for what games I'll be posting, it could be zombies, it could not be, because <laughs> believe it or not, I do play games other than Call of Duty Zombies, so I'm going to try and mix it up, because I don't want to be solely defined by my zombies retrospective, I'd like to have a bit more broad of a scope on YouTube. Real quick, I just want to thank you guys, the viewers, for sticking with my videos through all this because my channel has grown from, I think, 35 subscribers to 175 by the time I'm recording this in less than a month. So, it's crazy. I've been seeing maybe three subscribers every other week. Like, this is just... I can't put into words how crazy this is to me. To anyone who found these videos and subscribed and has been watching them, like, thank you from the bottom of my heart. It means more than you could ever imagine. Thank you. I'd also like to give special thanks to my friends Mom Tasty and Topaz Degree. You would also know them as David and Julian if you've watched my other videos. Uh, they've been helping me get the footage for these videos. They've just been such... They've been, like, really fun teammates to play with. Overall, I wouldn't have made these videos without them. I would have gotten bored past knocked. I don't think I would have made it to Verruck. So thank you to you two as well. I couldn't have asked for better friends to make these videos with. Alright, but this is Tactic Zombies signing out. Peace out. God bless. I'll see you guys on the flip side. Yeah, cause I got it like that. Flow so smooth like I got it on tap. Yeah, and I'ma say it be a good night while I'm on my yingling, while I'm drinking Bud Light. Uh, can you get it when you miss me?